Well, welcome everyone. My name is Matt. If this is your very first time with us, I am so grateful that you're here. I know it's not easy walking into a building for the first time. And if you're at Vincent's or Princeton or here at Washington, grateful that you're joining us as we start this new sermon series titled Commission. And today also is a very uh, exciting day. Um, this is a moment where uh, we do it about, I don't know, once a year or so, kind of in that frame where we go out and we leave this place. We leave these rooms at all of our campuses and we start to pack some meals. And so we have 70,000 meals that we have to pack today. And I am requesting everybody at every campus take a moment and do some meal packing right after each service. We're going to worship and then we can get our We can get our work on. How about that? And Princeton's already beat us to it. Princeton yesterday already did some work uh, while they packed some meals. Thousands of meals have been packed already before us. They've kind of set the way. Way to go, Princeton, on getting some things done. That's them right there in their building that's under construction right on the square. And we're excited for you as you get ready to move into your new building. Some of you are like, what are we talking about with campuses? Bethany Christian Church is one church that meets over multiple locations. And so right now I'm speaking to folks in Princeton and Vincennes and all of you here at Washington and those online as well today. And Bethany is a large church, but we try to make it as small as possible by having these different campuses in our region. And one of the things I want to do today is to reacquaint all of us to our vision, mission, and purpose. Um, It's not that it's like something that you have to internalize, something that you have to like go, oh, I got to memorize this. That's not it at all. It's really something that we just want to put out there to show you what we're after so that if you've just come on board in the last year, you know what we're, what we're all about. Because some people have the wrong idea of church. They think church is for them. They think church is about them. When church is not you, it's not about you. It's about lifting high Jesus Christ. And what we discovered is churches without a clear vision, businesses without a clear vision, People without a clear vision, they'll easily get distracted. They'll chase and run after anything and everything. And when you chase and run after anything, everything, and lose your focus, you lose your purpose. And so we don't want to be that place. We don't want to be a rudderless church that just kind of gets blown around by the winds or the current of our culture. And friends, uh, that happens a lot in our society. I mean, one of the favorite nights of the week when I was growing up was Friday night. And my mom and dad would order a pizza But before they ordered a pizza, we'd always go to one place. We'd make it a blockbuster night. Remember going, maybe you're like, I have a blockbuster, that doesn't ring a bell to me. Okay, all right, let me get more Midwest. Family video kind of night. You're like, oh yeah, I know that. That's the old Dollar General, right? No, no, it's not. Family video is what it is. And you guys, who remembers just walking around the rows and rows of movies? And I'm talking about when they were filled with VHS tapes. VHS tapes? Look at, oh my goodness, there's hardly any of you. There's hardly any of us left. And uh, if you didn't rewind the movie, remember it was like 50 cents if you didn't rewind the movie, right? You're like, rewind the movie, what's, and remember the little sticker would be on every film? Be kind, rewind, right? (laughs) Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about right now? Like you remember DVDs and you remember Blu-ray, but you don't remember VHS. Listen, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You have no idea what it was like to go on a date in the 1990s or 2000s, right? Any, any people go dating in 1990s, 2000s, early 2000s, it was like dinner, and it wasn't just dinner and a movie, it was dinner and go look for a movie, right? Because that took about an hour of your time. Nothing more, more fun than hanging out in family video, just meandering around with all the other couples who didn't know what to do on a Friday night either. And then, then going home and watching that movie later. But here's what would happen. You would kind of meander around the rows and you finally find one you both agreed on. Eight out of 10 times, it wasn't, in, it wasn't even there. Like you'd have to wait till someone turned it back in. Some of you are just like, what are you, got, what are you even talking about? Okay, you know how you sit on your couch or sit in your bed and you look through your streaming services about what to watch next and it takes like 45 minutes and you're looking through the genres and the TV shows and all the things that are supposed to be in your algorithm that are perfect for you but you can't find anything to watch? Okay, that's a lot like how I grew up but we would go to the movie store and meander around there instead. And uh, it, was our, it, was our, it was our weekend night basically just kind of looking around and um, that doesn't exist anymore, does it? Where are the blockbusters? Gone. Where's the family videos? Gone. Where are the video stores? Gone. Why? Because they didn't turn the corner. Like their vision was they wanted everybody to have videos basically on demand. Anytime they showed up, they could grab a video. They wanted to distribute films and movies. Isn't that what Netflix is doing? Hulu's doing that. Disney Plus is doing that. They're all doing that. But they didn't, these video stores, they didn't turn with the methodology of how things had changed. The vision is the same, but the methodology has changed. 
And they didn't turn with that. And some of you remember family, family video when it started selling like CBD oil? Really missed your purpose there, right? Like, what are we doing now? I don't even understand this anymore. Like, that's, that was like on the last dying breaths. They just lost focus. I'm, t- I'm telling you, anytime a church, a person, a business loses its vision, loses its focus, it will start to run after anything, even CBD oil. And um, they lose their purpose. And that's not, that's not how we want Bethany Christian Church to be. And so we have a vision and we think that vision is something that God's not only laid on our heart, but we think it's very scriptural. The vision is very simple to exalt Christ Jesus so that all will be saved. It's, it's pretty simple to remember that Christ is lifted up more than anything else, more than our name, more than us, more than what we do, more than the 70,000 meals we're about ready to pack and send overseas. No, Christ is lifted up so that all will be saved. I don't save people. The church doesn't save people. Only Jesus Christ saves you. And friends, that's in harmony with what's called the Great Commission, something that Jesus had said right before he ascended into heaven. He said to go into all the world and make disciples. Well, let's look at it. Matthew chapter 28, it's page 811 in the Bibles that are in front of you or at your campus on a table somewhere. Grab one of those, page 811, maybe get on your, your, your device and type in Matthew 28. We're gonna look at verses 16 through 20. Matthew is the gospel writer. And he is a tax collector that gave himself over to Jesus. He was crooked. He was no good. People despised him. He gave himself over to Jesus, started following Jesus. And Jesus not only changed his life around, but also started to change his reputation as well. Give him newness of life. And Matthew's gospel is just his eyewitness account about what he saw as he traveled with Jesus for three and a half years. And so he wants to tell us what he heard Jesus say right before Jesus Uh, ascended into heaven. So this is after his death, burial, and resurrection. He meets with his disciples and 500 plus people see him and then he ascends into heaven. Here's what Jesus said when he met with the 11 disciples. Judas had killed himself by this time. It says in verse 16 in Matthew 28, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So they have this meetup spot, maybe even where the Sermon on the Mount was preached. Verse 17, when they saw him, that's the disciples, they worshiped him. I love that because they, they were with Jesus for three and a half years. They see Jesus in resurrected bodily form and they worship him. But I love this next part, but some doubt it. Right, some doubt it. And that's why we say at Bethany Christian Church that this is a place for worshipers and for doubters. This is a place where we know people are gonna come in to celebrate who Christ is in their life, but there's also gonna be some people here that have maybe a little bit of doubt or, or full skeptic mode. That's fine because you're in, good, you're in a good place because the 11 disciples who walk with Jesus for three and a half years see the resurrected Savior and some of them worship, but yet still some of them doubt it. They needed proof. And maybe you need some proof as well. That's fine. He goes on to say that what Jesus said to them in verse 17, he came to him and said, all authority, meaning God has given me this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And you can probably memorize this in some form. You could probably repeat it back in some way. Go and make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. That's a very famous piece of scripture. You hear preachers talk about it a lot. Churches talk about it a lot. And it's a call to evangelism. It's a call to go. It's a call to get out of your house. It's a call to get out of the ch- church and, and to go and spread the message of Jesus places. And that's typically how it's set up. But when Jesus had said that, that wasn't the, the reason for him saying it at all. It wasn't a call to evangelism. It was a call to simply live life amongst the community. And as you live life amongst the community, you are to then be Christ Jesus to the community that you're surrounded in. You're to be Christ Jesus at your home with your non-believing spouse. Be Christ Jesus to your kids that maybe were doubting or skeptical of faith. You're to be Christ Jesus to the people in your workplace. You weren't to be like this great preacher. You weren't to have this great story of how Christ saved you from death to life, though that's good. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was just saying, you need to go and need to tell about who I am through what you do so that others will come to know me. Exalt him so that all will be saved. Some people call that the great go. Jesus never gave it a title, but most scriptures call it the great commission. When the early church first started, it started with a ton of power. The 
called the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came amongst those 11 apostles as they waited in an upper room and they were fearful, but the power of God took hold of them and they began to speak in tongues. I don't quite understand all that, but uh, whatever they were saying, people were understanding what they're hearing. And there's a bunch of different languages and people who represented different dialects, but they were speaking maybe a divine language and they were all hearing the same, the same verbiage. And Peter preaches that amazing gospel message and 3,000 are baptized into Christ that day. And uh, people are like, well, I don't like big churches. Well, that's how the church started, was a big church, like a mega church immediately in Jerusalem. And that church grew to about 20,000 people. They didn't have a building. They met in the temple courts because they, they all wanted to centralize and worship. But they would meet in small groups. And so they started by families coming together. And I'm not talking like families, like, you know, like four people, five people. I'm not these huge families, long amounts of generations and in-laws and everybody else would come together and they would, they would have small group. If you want to see what the church is really like, get into Acts chapter two, look in like the last five verses, incredible picture of unity and a incredible picture of how the believers were so unified around Jesus Christ. And they'd get together and they'd have these worship times on the first day of the week, like we do together. And then as course of time moved on, the apostles began to spread the message of Jesus Christ to the known world. And so they'd go on long missionary journeys and they'd hop on these ships and have these long journeys. They established churches all around outside of Jerusalem. And, and uh, people like the apostle Paul, he's most famous for being one of the great missionaries. And these churches would pop up in places like Ephesus or Philippi or, or, or Corinth. And, and he was training teachers and preachers like Timothy and Titus. And these amazing movements of God were happening. And uh, so these churches are being planted independently all around the world and they're no longer in Jerusalem anymore. And then as the apostles begin to die off, uh, these independent churches that were scattered were like, hang on, we need someone to help us. Like we, we don't know, like, can you help us understand Jesus better? Because you knew him and you walked with him and now these guys are dying off. We don't have anything to really help us set the course and be a foundation for us. So they created this little like what they called a council. And so they... Anytime they had questions of doctrine or questions about Jesus or questions on how to handle discipline in the church, they'd kind of like write a letter back to Jerusalem, you know, and they would ask these questions and they would report back. And that's what some of our letters are in the New Testaments. Paul helping churches out, helping them see their way in a very difficult soil of society. And then all the apostles die off. And there's like thousands of churches and they're going, well, what do we do now? Like we don't have the apostles to help us out. And the Bible's beginning to be circulated. The letters of Jesus and the testimonies of Jesus are about being circulated. But there's no more apostles and hundreds of years go by and these churches are now trying to figure out what to do next. And they're feeling totally disjoined from one another. There's no longer that feeling of unity. And right about that time, the nation of Rome, the government of Rome was about on its final breath and they're trying to persecute Christians, but they're not winning. And there's this old adage that says, if you can't beat them, join them. And so Rome decides we're going to embrace Christianity. We're going to embrace this because we can't beat them. And so they go to the church in Rome and they say, how do we embrace Christianity? And the church fathers in Rome start to develop a plan with the Roman officials and government. And they come up with what we know as the Roman Catholic Church, the church universal. And it started good, started right. It's nothing like what you would know it today. It wasn't involved with all this priesthoods and hierarchies. It was basically a way to say, how do we get all these churches in the world to understand the doctrine of Jesus better so that Christ can be exalted and all can be saved. It had really good methodology and push behind it. But over the course of time, friends, you know what's taken place, not just in the Catholic church, but in Christendom. Denominations have popped up and everybody says, no, no, no. We have a better understanding of Jesus than they have a better understanding of Jesus. We have a better understanding of the Bible than they have a better understanding of the Bible. And they became within this denominational movement of all these denominations. There's 34,000 denominations today, by the way, all saying we have a better understanding or better thought about God. What's, taught, what's really happened is they've, they've left Christ in the dust and they've accepted some man-made creeds. And they've less, left doctrine in the dust and they've accepted the dogma of man. You're like, why are we having this church history lesson? Because I want you to know where Bethany Christian Church came from. We didn't come from any of that. We came from a movement about 200 years ago called the Great Awakening, where a group of preachers in the United States got together and said, we are so tired of this denominational business. 
we are so tired of what used to take place and used to divide us. Can we not just get back to the scriptures like the Acts chapter two stuff when faith was alive and vibrant, where we didn't have a hierarchy over our head, where we didn't have somebody far away from us telling us what we should preach on, telling us how we should structure our church. Can we just get back to the basics of the Bible? Friends, that's Bethany Christian Church back in Montgomery in 1830. No, that's probably 1800. I don't know. I'm not a historian. I have no clue when that is. Okay, I just know it's old. We were established in 1830, and uh, men used to, I think, Jay, was it men on the left used to come in on the left, and women used to come in on the right? You think we should bring that back? Don't think so. That's not happening. Uh Uh-uh. That's not how you grow a church. I'll tell you that. But Bethany Christian Church was one of those churches that came out of that, that great awakening, the second great awakening in the United States. And it was these men that just had this call that said, listen, let's just get back to God's word the best that we can. Like, 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 we know it's not gonna be perfect. We know it's not gonna be infallible, but let's just get back to the book of Acts and let's just get back to making Jesus Christ the king and no creed but Christ. No dogma, just the doctrine of Jesus. Let's get back to that. And so that's what we've been trying to do. Like since 1830, that's what we've been trying to do. We're independent. There's no one over us. There's no denomination. Just trying to, with fear and trembling, trying to walk the line of what Christ Jesus and the early church fathers have shown us in God's word. And friends, we know that churches are only as good as their leadership is godly. We get that. So there's good moments and there's unhealthy moments in the life of 200 years nearly of Bethany Christian Church. And um, if the leadership in a church is allowing God to lead Listen, the church will be healthy and will be able to do ministry well and it will grow. But today I want to remind you of a valuable truth. You want to know what the valuable truth is? We are not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. Listen, Bethany Christian Church, we're not the only Christians. We don't have the handle on it. We don't have it all figured out. We we, we don't have everything right about who God is. I mean, how do you get everything right about a a God that is enormous and infinite? Are you going to be, are, are, are finite minds going to be able to figure him out? No way. So there's gonna be some places where we're probably not correct, but we know with, without a shadow of a doubt who Jesus is. We know that he died, rose, that he became savior of the world for me and you and for all of our sins. And friends, we are not the only Christians, but we're Christians only. If we can just hold on to the common ground of that, that we need Christ, the world needs Christ, and other churches need to preach Christ, we're in good shape. And I don't want you to think for just even a, a nanosecond that this church is better than any other church or that we got it more right than the other church. That leads to arrogancy. That leads to a place where it says, we're right, you're wrong. No, no, we're working out our faith with fear and trembling. And we're trying to do the best that we can to live up to the standards of God and live according to God's word. And I'll tell you what, it's a really high standard that God has us called to. And here's another thing we know. We also know that we believe that the church is bigger than Bethany. It's bigger than us. It's way bigger than us. The last count, Princeton, here's what I totaled up in the city limits of Princeton. 31 churches in Princeton. 54 churches in Vincennes. 48 in Washington. Listen, they come and go, so those numbers are always changing. That's a total of 133 churches in our three communities that we minister to. That's just in the city limits. I mean, there's probably 200 plus churches surrounding. And, and maybe you're like me. I was puzzled at one time, like, do we really need all these churches? You know, we're putting this new campus in Princeton, right on the city square. It's prominent. Princeton loves their city square. It's gorgeous. They've done so good with making that kind of a place that kind of is restorative and has great history to it. We took over one of the old buildings and man, we are, we are putting lipstick on the pig. I'll tell you what, it's looking good though. It's looking good. And Princeton, you're gonna have an amazing building. You know it, you know it better than I do, how it's gonna be such a help to you all as you get a place to permanently worship and get out of that movie theater. But every time that thing goes on social media, when there's a new like, I don't know, like, you know, revealing of what the building's looking like, we always get the same kind of comments from the naysayers. Really, do we need another church in Princeton? Is that really what we need? And I understand that. Like, I kind of sympathize with those that aren't in faith and they just see another church popping up. They're like, what's the deal, man? There's more churches than there are weeds in this county, I know. And I'm like, can't we all just get along or do we really need them all? I, I, man, I used to think that all the time. One day God just took a hold of me. We got this church just right across the street here at Washington. We got a church just like, what? It's like, I don't know, maybe 150 yards here to our south, and then, an, then another one 50 yards away from that, from the south. I'm like, do we, really, do we really need all these? And God's like, Matt, we do, we do. Because people don't all like you, Matt. 
And what I discovered is churches are like personalities, and it's not based on the pastor, but there's kind of like a personality of a church. And if you've been a part of a couple, you've, you've experienced this. And God needs every single church because it has a different source of persuasion towards the people that God wants to connect to. And so we should be in celebration that there are so many different pockets and communities of believers, but we shouldn't be so disunified. But we recognize that the church is far bigger than Bethany Christian Church, and God has called all these congregations to do the same thing, to go and to make disciples of all nations. And while we are a big church and we can accomplish big objectives, we, we can't do it all. We can't do it all. And we need every single believer in our entire region, regardless of their church name, to exalt Jesus Christ so all that can be saved. Remember what Jesus had called us to, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the very ends of the age. You might read that and say, well, Jesus is emphasizing go, and so we should all get out of here. We should all go overseas, and we should all do regional missions and, and local missions and, and global missions. But what, what is God calling us to do in this? Is he calling us just to baptize people? Is he calling us to teach people? Well, I'll tell you, at the very heart of it, he's calling us that we should go and exalt him so that people will become disciples of him. But I think at the core of what he's calling us to do is to embrace and expand God's kingdom. And I think every congregation, regardless of their name or denomination, is called by Jesus Christ here in Matthew 28 to embrace and expand God's kingdom, not our own kingdom. Because many times churches like to expand their kingdom. Christ is telling us to expand God's kingdom. And let me break down what kingdom means in God's heavenly definition. It's the two words king and dom in Latin. King just meaning sovereign or rule, that, that there's a king of kings. And it doesn't matter if you acknowledge him or not, that, that God sits on a throne. Christ Jesus sits at the right hand of the one on the throne. And they both have dominion. They both have rule over us, all that we do. And whether you acknowledge or not, they're still in charge. And that's kingdom. They have sovereign rule over all things. But the dom is territory. It's, it's soil. It's, it's things that you can take over, dominion or territory. And what Jesus is really calling us to do is as churches, as Christians, to take domain for the king, to take territory for the king. You may have never thought about it that way. But he's calling us to take dominion, domain for the kingdom, the kingdom of God. You can catch this in the way in the, which the book of Acts ends itself. The book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles. It's a brief history of how the early church began. It's core to how we do things here at Bethany. And the book of Acts concludes by saying that the church took ground and gained subjects for the king of kings. Here's how it says it. The last verse, I think it's Acts 28, verse 31. It says that the apostles were proclaiming the kingdom of God. That's that he's king of kings, he has sovereignness, and that they're taking domain, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the, doesn't that sound, it's starting to sound just like Matthew 28, isn't it? And teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with what? With boldness and without hindrance. And they're able to do that because the power of God is at work within them, and they're able to go on and preach who Jesus is, that he's king of kings and he's Lord of lords and not hold back. And they're able to preach on the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of their little congregation. And they're able to do that with great boldness and hindrance because they're, they're speaking of a king that is everlasting and a kingdom that will never be shaken with boldness and without hindrance. Guys, I think it's those two words which many of congregations have abandoned. I think there's a reason why so many churches right now are, are fluttering. They're just wondering on Monday how they're going to keep their doors open next Sunday. It's because they've lost boldness and without hindrance. And, and I, I have my theories. One of my theories is they've, they've, they've misplaced doctrine and they've turned into some kind of man-made dogma. They've replaced Christ and they've turned it into some creed. They've come more about the church and their cause than Christ and his cause? Because here's the rub about all this. Here's the rub. I think churches have lost the boldness and, the, and, and without hindrance in their proclamation of Jesus. The rub is 34,000 different denominations making up, check this out, 37 million different congregations on the face of the earth. Okay, do you, if you, okay 7 billion people. I know it's big math. Just take out some zeros. 
37 million congregations, 7 billion people. If you were to just say everybody is one over to Jesus Christ and they need a house to worship in, you could put about 200 people in every single church and we're doing okay. There's room, okay? There's room for every sinner who could become saved. There's room. There's enough Christians to get this done. The problem is we're not getting it done. Why aren't we getting it done? Because too many churches, too many congregations, too many denominations, and we could be there too, have stopped selling videos and started selling CBD oil. You know what I'm saying, right? They stopped preaching Jesus. They've got into some kind of like social engagement on rights. You know what I'm saying? They've got into other things that culture has persuaded them on and they lost grip of it. They've gotten themselves in battles about what the Bible says, where it should say it, and, and we're arguing now with other churches about things that have nothing to do with our salvation. Just minute little silly stuff. And we get caught up in all these speed bumps and we're wondering why we're not taking ground for the kingdom because we don't have the boldness anymore. We don't have the without hindrance anymore. Because why? We're too busy protecting our little kingdom and our name on the sign out on the front of the road. Rather than just simply saying, this is about taking domain for the king. And friend, the temptation for Bethany is always there. It is, and that's why we believe. We believe our primary allegiance is to Christ and his cause and not a congregational name. So like, listen, I, I know there's churches like, hey, where's our bumper stickers? Where's our, where, where's our like license plate you know, banners that go around. Where, where's our teachers that say, I love Bethany or whatever. We ain't gonna get those. Because we're not about our name. We could really care less in leadership if our name is known. We want Jesus Christ's name known. And listen, I know you're like, well, you guys have a sign out there. You guys have a, a name. Well, you gotta have a name if you wanna be on the map. If you wanna find us on Google, you have to have something. But listen, we are, we are so against trying to build the kingdom of Bethany and so for trying to build the kingdom of God. Because what we're finding so often in Christendom, especially in you know, evangelical circles, where you know, more like, if you want to title it, Protestant-style churches, is that there are people that have fallen in love with the church, but they have not fallen in love with Jesus Christ. And they're all about their church, and they're serving, and they're working, and they're sweating, and they're working their fingers to the bone for the church and its cause, but they're not doing it for Jesus Christ. Like Jesus Christ is secondary to them, but the church is first. And they want their church to be famous and they want their church to be the best church in town. Friend, we're not about being the best church in town. We're about being the best church for our town. <laughs> Distinct difference right there. And to do that, you're gonna have to proclaim Jesus and be Jesus. You're gonna be those two things. I have this coach that helps me. I got, I got plenty of coaches that help me out in leading and pastoring and preaching. And one guy's a, a church growth coach and, he told me, he said, man, if I could do things differently, I, here's what I would do differently. He said, as his church began to grow, he realized how desperate he was in need of full-time and part-time staff people. And so, you know, they're just, they're, there's, there's a lack of preachers. There's a lack of pastors right now, uh, especially really good ones. There's, there's a lack of it. And so you need to celebrate our staff team because we have like some of the best people around. And he said, that his first urge was, let's just go to the people in the congregation that are serving hard, doing it well, and seem to have a love for what they're doing. And he said he hired those people and put them on staff. And what he realized real quick was, the moment that the church changed its methodology or the moment that the church did something different, they got upset and they walked away from that staff position and they walked away from the church. Here's what he was ultimately concluding. He said, they were more in love with the church than they were in Christ. And when the church burned them or when they felt slighted by the church, they felt let down. And when they felt let down, they left because their allegiance wasn't in Christ, their allegiance was in the church. Friends, the church is always gonna let you down, okay? Because it's filled with like people like me and you. And, and we know how to let people down. It's not like we do it intentionally, but it's always gonna let, but Christ Jesus will never let us down. So how about we just formulate our church the best we can around Christ Jesus? How about we start serving for Christ Jesus, living for Christ Jesus, ministering for Christ Jesus? Listen, I, I love Bethany Christian Church. I love Bethany Christian Church because I love you all. That's why I love Bethany Christian Church. I don't love, I don't love the, the signage, the logo. I don't love the building space. I love you all. That's why I love Bethany Christian Church. And I just wanna warn you for a moment that you might say, well, I love Bethany Christian Church too. Okay, but where, where's your hope found? 
Is it found in the church or is it found in Christ? Where's your joy found? Is it found in the church or is it found in Christ? Where, where's your love found? Is it found in the church or is it found in Christ? Because if it's found in the church, it's gonna let you down and you'll leave it. But if it's found in Christ Jesus, we're all good. We're all good. And we can continue forward regardless of what congregational name we are. We can continue forward because the church is bigger than the preacher in the pulpit. It's bigger than programs. It's bigger than blueprints and building projects. When your allegiance is to Christ Jesus, it's bigger than any church or congregation. And friends, I, I need to remind you and warn you for a moment that as this thing continues to grow and get big, there's kind of this thought of like, well, we, could, we can have this arrogancy or, or think you're doing it by your own power. Man, there's a real pridefulness about that. Look what we've done. We haven't done it. Like we, we believe our vision can only be fulfilled by God's power at work within us. I was thinking back this last week and, you know, we were in Montgomery. I came on board here in spring of 99, was asked to become the full-time pastor, uh, lead pastor in 2000. I was 22 years old, which should have you question our leadership. Um, and I was reminded when uh, we were in the parsonage for our offices. So it was just east of our building in Montgomery. Um, and we moved out of that. We needed to liquidate that property, get cash out of it because we wanted to come and relocate in Washington because God was just expanding um, the church there at the time. And we wanted to stay ahead of the growth. And so we liquidated that building, got the cash out of it, and it displaced our staff team of about five people. So we made offices up in the old balcony and it looked like stables where horses were kept. And so we all had our little stable slot up there, but uh, we had to transfer all of our stuff from that office back into this little stable or cubicle area. And I had all these books. And so I would pile all these books up in this huge Tupper, you know, rubber, rubber made kind of tote thing. You know, I'm talking about the big ones and, and they're so heavy. So it took two of us to carry it. And I remember one evening when we were just trying to get things set up real quick. I had my kids with me at the time and my twins were like four years old. They're short little scrawny kids. And I remember trying to get those Tupper made Rubbermaid uh, boxes up the, the steps with all those books and it was just so heavy. I mean, just pile of books. And then one of my little four-year-olds pushing up the steps while I was pulling up the steps. He wasn't helping out. But pushing up, pulling up the steps. I finally got up with the carpet and finally he, we start pushing. I'm nearly out of gas because I'm like done this a hundred times already. And now I'm dragging it on the carpet and I'm just like, take a break. My dad, and then my little four-year-old's yelling at me. He's like, get out of the way, dad. Get out of the way. <laughs> okay, get out of the way. He starts to try to push this huge, heavy, rubber-made thing of books across the carpet. He's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. And then it dawned on me, he was mad at me because he thought I was in the way because he thought he was supplying all the power to push the books. <laughs> and that's when I stood back and just watched him like grunt and groan and, you know, kind of like do, you know, the circular motion of his feet on the carpet, not getting any traction. And I just shook my head at him because he thought he supplied the power. It's just, it, it just makes me wonder how many times God just shakes his head at us when we think we're the power of this place. When we think we're the ones pushing this place forward. And we're trying to tell him, like, get out of the way. God's like, I'm the power. I'm the power to you. And I don't want you to ever forget that. That without God, this is nothing more than an elaborate country club. So this isn't my church, and it's not your church. Can we agree that it's Christ Jesus Church? He's the one that died for it. And we're not in a perfect place. But friends, we're trying to be a godly place that exalts Jesus Christ so that all can be saved. In just a moment, every campus, I guess excluding Princeton, is gonna go and do some meal packing. But first I wanna pray and then your campus pastor will direct you on what to do next. Father, we wanna, we wanna give you our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. We wanna give you our ability, our leadership. We wanna give you what we do here every single day, every single week, every single Sunday morning. 
our worship and we want to give you the honor and the praise. May we get out of the way. May we allow you to be the power. May we just be the conduit for it and work through us, work in us. And we know we're not right all the time. And so, Father, may we not try to position ourselves as being arrogant. May we be hungry and humble to move the gospel forward. May we do it with boldness and without hindrance. And so, Father, I, I know my desperate plea here today. I pray that it sinks in to the hearts and the minds of these men and women that are hearing me today, that there's something going on at Bethany Christian Church that is not about us, it's about you. It's about you. And so what we're about to do next and what we've been doing this weekend by providing meals, it ain't about us, it's about you. And so use these meals to, to make the message of Jesus go past us into Thailand and Burma where these meals are gonna be distributed. Use these meals as a conduit for your message to show other people that, that Christian people love them, that Christ is for them. And Father, that, that as they're getting their, their bellies filled by this meal, it will lead to their hearts being full through the gospel. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen.